Hi, Paul. Hi, Bob. How, How are you doing? doing? I am doing well. How are you? I couldn't be better. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're a Paul Bloom, professor of psychology at Yale, where you hold an endowed chair, no less, author of a number of books, How Pleasure Works, Against Empathy. We're going to talk about empathy today. We are. Right. And we're also going to talk about dehumanization. Two excellent topics. Yeah. In fact, is it fair to summarize your moral philosophy as saying that you are against empathy and in favor of dehumanization? Yeah, I mean, it's incomplete because I'm also in favor of suffering. So, <laughs> so once you have that in, yeah. I'm basically in favor of everything uh, bad and against everything good. And then you have me. Okay. But, but, but actually, actually, I mean, maybe we'll get there, but, but uh, dehumanization isn't all bad. Treating other people, as, if you forget right. about other people's humanity, that's really bad. Right. But if in certain occasions, whatever, you don't obsess in their humanity, you, you think of them in a more um, abstract way, it could be good. Or maybe you flatter them via dehumanization, you know? Chicago Bulls. The Chicago, Chicago Bulls. I'd love to be a Chicago Bull. Yeah, or who wouldn't want to be a cute puppy? I think I'd rather be a uh, Chicago okay. Bull. Yeah. Um. So, uh, yeah, so for starters, there was this, we should say, by the way, that this all comes under the rubric of psychopolitics, what I, which I would say is our specialty, right? When people think of Paul Bloom, Bob Wright, they think psychopolitics. They probably think many things, but that's high on the list. Actually, so, probably oh. rare, very few people think of that combination of names to begin with. But if they did, Psycho psychopolitics would be one thing they could think of if they had listened to our last couple of conversations on this yep. platform. Yep. And some interesting stuff has come out in that realm. One was a, a study on empathy that I wrote up in Wired. And as we've said, you're against empathy. So you were keenly interested in this new finding. We could talk about that. And then there's a paper on, uh, on dehumanization that you had me uh, yep. quickly scan, which I've done. And, you know, here, and I think let me give you a heads up about an overarching question I'm going to ask in the end. Is it not the case that the debate over empathy is more important than the debate over dehumanization. You don't have to tell us now, but I know you have joined in both debates. You have told people to be careful about unequivocally embracing, undiscerningly embracing empathy in all of its manifestations because empathy can lead us astray. It can lead to bad things. And you have also uh, argued that dehumanization isn't quite the root of evil that some people think. Now, Right now, I am of the view that the first debate is more important than the second debate, but let's hold off on that question. Yeah. Until we I, I, I think you're right, but I would also say that in some way, at some abstract level, they're the same debate. Hmm. We're, we're, we're talking about the roles of uh, feelings, of emotions in our moral and political lives. And, and I think the question, I, so I think in some way the questions about empathy and question dehumanization kind of meet together a little bit. Yeah, I think that's true. And yeah, I, I guess I, I guess my question would be, there's all kinds of, of ways I would want to caution people about uh, using empathy as a guide. Like if, yeah. if, if they, uh, if before the run up to one of the two Iraq wars, somebody comes before Congress and testifies that Saddam Hussein is pulling the plug out of incubators for babies, I would caution them for two reasons that turned out not to be true. Um, but also I'd be, yeah. you know, be mindful that like people play on empathy to try to get you to follow political guidance that may or may not work out well in the long run. There are a lot of other reasons you've talked about, like the, what is it? Baby Jessica in the well or whatever in mid in Texas. Uh, mid I, mean, I call these empathy traps, a term which has not caught on despite my effort to throw into everyday conversation articles. And this is when somebody sort of tells you, let me tell you a story. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. There's this, this horrific thing that the immigrants are doing. Let me tell you a story about this person died from uh, inadequate health care. Story, story, story. Everybody has the stories. Uh, people who are highly empathic get moved by these stories. And sometimes these stories are in service of a good cause. Politicians I like, they're good at stories. But Sometimes they're in service of terrible causes. Uh, if it's a good war, the stories of the atrocities will get, get us motivated to fight the war, and it's a good thing. But I think more often, 
you hear the stories of these atrocities by the Iraqis, by, by the immigrants, by whoever we're supposed to fight against, and they're meant to energize us to, uh, to violence, and, and, and they're often successful. So I, I think, you know, to, to bring this to politics, you and I have similar views on Trump, and I think Trump, while himself, is probably not an empathic or compassionate man, to say the Doesn't least. Doesn't seem to be. He's, he's very, he's actually. He has, he has not been led astray by empathy. It, I think it, it is. No, 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 whatever. Yeah, that, that's true. If I, there's I something leading him astray, that ain't it. Yeah, he's not too caught up in concern and compassion for others. But he's very good at the stories. He's very good at, at he, he's, he's surprisingly adroit at getting people riled up. Sometimes appealing to the worst sides of their nature, worst sides of their nature, xenophobia, hatred, fear, but sometimes appealing to concern and compassion. He, um, he very quickly and very skillfully got the idea of talking about crimes committed by immigrants, telling stories about the victims, having the victims on stage with him, and using this to catalyze hatred towards, towards uh, immigrants, illegal and otherwise. When people say, oh, empathy could do no harm, I just, I just give them some Trump quotes. Right. And then in the uh, after the al-Baghdadi killing, you'll you know, he went he, he did this like endless riff about yeah. the killing of Baghdadi. But he kept throwing in references to the Americans <laughs> who had been beheaded by ISIS, it, by, just by way of, of kind of, you know, amplifying the public yeah. appreciation of the death of, of Baghdadi, which was also in its own way, rhetorically skillful. So anyway, the, the question that I hope hovers over this conversation is, is it not uh, more important to caution people against all this stuff than to caution them against thinking dehumanization is always bad, but we can, we can hold, hold yeah. off on that question for now. The, the um, uh, so do you want to talk, you want to start off by talking about this interesting uh, empathy study from well, you wrote, uh, you wrote an article on it. I wrote a whole article on it in wired. Yeah, and, good, and got good a little idea. got a little blowback from your friend uh, Tamler, by the way. Your your oh. your very bad wizard's friend Tamler. Oh, Tamler! Uh, Tamler, Tamler had a point. Tamler. No, Tamler. he didn't. Now we don't have to argue about that We're now because really it's, in the middle here. it's a little obscure, but we'll get to it. Okay, we'll get to it. And by the way, I do have the power to like totally unplug your mic. <laughs> I just well, you, you know, there's another podcast that the Tamler's on where I'm sure I'll have a voice. Yeah, but that's different. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think, I personally think I should be invited on that podcast, by the way. I've been on, but I think I should be on again. I mean, if he's going to take these clearly unwarranted shots at me. He's right? plainly calling you out. Why? No, he's plainly calling you out with these uh, Twitter yeah. shots. Yeah, it's like, uh, okay, anyway. We, we are so much beginning in the middle here. That, that we, are, we are. We are. We're talking about Tamler Summers, who, a yeah. co-host of Very Bad Wizards. But there's a great segue here because he's a philosopher at the University of Houston. The study we're going to talk about has three authors, two of whom are at the University of Houston. Very, very well planned. Thank you. It's it was in American great. Political Science Review. So I guess they're political scientists. Do you know for sure Elizabeth Seamus, S-I-M-A-S? I, I don't know who you, they are. You would know her if she's a psychologist, probably. I, so, I, I like that you call this an alpha journal. It is, an, it is one of political science's alpha journals. I, I, I did, yes. Yeah. In, the, in the article, I called it that. By way of establishing its credibility, this is a serious study because it's in that journal. It's a serious and, study. And here's what the study found. So we already, there were already a number of studies indicating that people uh, often have more empathy for people in the in-group than people in the out-group, you know, especially if there's, in, well, almost yeah. by definition, but if there's antagonism between the groups, two soccer teams, for example, they're more empathic toward their fan, fans on their side than the other fans, that kind of thing. What this study found is a couple of things. First of all, people who are higher in, in trait empathy or, or empathic concern, I think is the term, yep. which is to say that uh, when you give them like a survey, they report that they feel a lot of empathy for people in certain situations and so on. So it's a self-report scale. You're counting on their own evaluation, their level of empathy. On the other hand, I guess that scale it's been widely used and has been validated in certain ways that that uh, I guess lend uh, credence to it. Although we can we can get into that, but in any event, people who are who, who score high on that scale also score 
high on, I think, what the authors called affective polarization. In other words, more intensely antagonistic emotions uh, toward people in the other party. Some specific manifestations of that were um, in, uh, I mean, first of all, they just correlated the attitudes. There's a scale for uh, for affective polarization and, and high empathy people were uh, more intense on on that, were scored higher on that scale. Secondly, they did uh, some studies. They had undergraduates and a lot of undergraduates, very high in kind of uh, like a thousand or something, um, uh, read a fake uh, news account about how there's a controversial speaker um, coming to campus and the speaker is, let's see, from the other party, right? Yeah, controversial speaker from the yeah. other party. High mm-hmm. empathy people are more likely to favor some form of deplatforming, support protesters who are trying to keep the person from speaking. Um, and also, who would have guessed, high empathy people are higher in Schadenfreude, but according to this study, uh, they are more likely to find amusement in a report that some bystander sympathetic to this speaker from the other party was injured by a protester. I think those are the key findings of this study. And then they explain kind of how they think it works. I didn't think they went into as much detail as they might have in sketching out the psychological dynamic, but we can get into that, uh, uh, which is interesting because your first reaction is probably to find the study ironic in need of, in need of uh, elaboration, uh, explanatory elaboration, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it fits with a lot of research, including some stuff I've done with some colleagues at Yale. Um, <clears throat> other research finding that when you, um, that there's sort of paradoxical effects of empathy, both as an individual difference measure, you know, measure how empathic somebody is, as this study did, but also when you induce it experimentally, when you motivate people to become empathic. And one of these is, and this is related to the, to the findings you talked about, one of these is that when you focus on one side of things, one side of a polarized issue, on the victims in a confrontation, people who are high empathy, are motivated to be high empathy, are often more punitive and angry at the other side. And, you know, there's psychological research on this, but this is flat out in Adam Smith's the theory of moral sentiments. When he says, you know, he says, I can't quote this from memory, but he says, you know, if you see somebody injured, you, you know, your feelings will go towards them and you will feel his pain and his humiliation and you'll want to strike back mm-hmm. at those who, who have injured him. And that's the sort of narrative we're talking about, how empathy could be weaponized. And so this study nicely fits with, uh, with, with a lot of work. I will add one qualification, which is the empathy I talk about, I'm most interested in my book, is more sort of a, a feeling what the other person feels. This sort of empathy they measure is something called empathic concern, which is this general emotional positivity towards other groups. And I think, it, I think if anything, it makes your study more interesting. But, yeah, well, it, but, but it does tap into specifically sympathetic feelings in cases of suffering, right? Yes, yes. So it's not like I'm a people person. It's no, like no. it's like when people suffer, I feel bad. Yeah. yeah. And so so one way of putting it is you ask people, do you feel bad when people suffer? And the extent to which they say yes is re- correlates uh, related to how politically polarized they are. So and, and, and you know, the um, now what's interesting, I didn't think about this where I wrote the article, is that, you know, all these studies like this take place in a particular political context. Yeah. And the context right now um, is that uh, when you ask people to gauge, you know, when you measure their uh, affective polarization, how intensely they dislike the other party, they're either they're probably either Trump supporters thinking about Democrats or Democrats thinking about Trump supporters. Um and and right and right now it's easy to think of specific ways this could play out. So, for example, if you're a Democrat uh, and you read about immigrants and children in cages, the way immigrants are treated, uh, if you're higher empathy, you're going to feel that more deeply, and you can well imagine how that could foster a more intense antagonism toward. Uh, Trump and his followers than you might feel if you were lower empathy, right? It it actually makes perfect sense in, in that context when you think about it. Yeah, that's, I think that's right. I think there, there's a couple of things. One thing is the current political dynamics 
going on now, which is mean we have extreme polarization, a very unusual degree. Um, and another one is just sort of structural properties of American politics. So I'm in Canada now, and one thing about Canada is we have more than two parties. Um, and and there's, there's more than two parties that really matter. And so if you're against one side, actually, if you're for one side, you're not automatically against another side. It depends. It's more complicated. And I think that would probably lower the effects we're talking about. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there have long been people who argued that we'd be better off with a parliamentary system. But I guess now we have another argument now that we're in a famously high polarization age. I, I should add for purposes of symmetry um, that if you want to ask, well, what could uh, conservatives uh, be empathic about that would get them more riled up against Democrats? I think abortion's an obvious example. They, they consider uh, a fetus to be a living human being. And so they consider that to be murder. And so if you're high empathy, that that might well um, increase your antagonism toward Democrats. So it can work both ways. But you can you can also imagine that at any given time, it might, depending on what the issues are, it might work more uh, in one direction or the other. And I don't think the authors in this case broke it down by party. It would be interesting to see if the findings were really fundamentally symmetrical. I'm not I'm not sure they talked about. Yeah. That. But, but you're right. And sometimes there's a pure symmetry. So I think sometimes gun control is a very symmetrical case where liberals are highly empathic towards the victims of gun violence. Uh, conservatives are highly empathic against people they see as defenseless against brutal criminals. Mm-hmm. Um, abortion is a case where you get a disfigured grounds. Affirmative action is a good case. You know, who do you, it, it, it's not like one side has empathy, the other one doesn't. It's like, who do you feel empathic for? You feel empathic for the minority kid who doesn't have a chance to get into Harvard. Or do you feel empathic for the white kid who did everything right and has great grades and worked his ass off, and now he can't get in because of the color of his skin? Right. Then there are other cases where, where, where there's empathy favors one side. Climate change has always struck me as interesting because climate change, it's hard to have an empathic argument for uh, worrying about climate change. There's no immediate victims. There's no villains. It's all statistical. It's all future. Well, you, can, you can imagine generations yet unborn, right? If you can do that vividly enough, maybe you can feel empathic. Yeah. See, there yeah. you go. There you go. Feeling no empathy. That's just like you. I saw that expression on your face. No, no, this is, this is how empathy works. I mean, you, empathy isn't the sort of abstract philosophical, like, oh, feel empathy for statistical individuals who are yet unborn. That's not how it works. You know, you gotta, you drag somebody in front of me, you say, feel empathy for this person, my, my, my uncle, my, my son. When you're as high empathy as I am, Paul, an abstraction <laughs> will do. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, you are not high empathy, and I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> you don't know me. Uh, although I must admit that your wife, my wife shares your view. Um, so, uh, let's, so here's, wait, I wanted to, oh, here's the question. So can it work in a high polarization age? Can it start working the other way where the polarization, where, where how you deploy your empathy becomes a function of the issue breakdown of the day? In other words, so here's a good example, like, okay, uh, people in resistance hate Trump. That's the first thing you decide. Then you hear Trump is associated with Russia. You find out Russia may have helped him in the election. He may be a Russian stooge. And so you hate Russia. And yeah. then this, the, the, the big uh, issue underlying the impeachment uh, inquiry shows up. And it's, it has to do with Russia and arming the Ukrainians who are being attacked by the Russians. Does the fact that you hate Trump supporters make you more empathic for the Ukrainians who you hear are being killed by Russian soldiers. I would submit that you start getting those kinds of uh, kind of reverse effects or whatever you call them in an age of high polarization. I mean, you know, the, the term is negative partisanship where yeah. your fundamental stance is you just hate the other party and then everything else follows from that in the extreme case. I would submit, I, you know, so I'm, I'm, as you know, a fan, I, a believer that we can make rational decisions and we're not totally caught up in party affiliations. And sometimes I think smart people could just think, I'm going to look at this issue and figure out who deserves my concern and who doesn't. But you're right. A lot of this, particularly for issues that at least I'm not following so closely, I'll just go with my team. And you're right. And this leads to some, to some, you know, modern, the last few years have been interesting in this regard. We're, we're treated to the idea of, um, of liberals and actually often radicals all of a sudden be extremely supportive of FBI and CIA agents, yeah. you know, 
How's Trump? Why is Trump maligning them? That's humiliating for them. They need more respect. But, you know, if they, they wouldn't do this if, if it was, uh, you know, somebody they liked. Uh, right. of- well, there's a segment of the left that really agrees with you, like Glenn Greenwald and so on. Um, and this Bottom position has gotten, has gotten them accused of being like, you know, Russian sympathizers and stuff. But, yes. but they, they would say they're trying to be true to principle. Um, but, yeah, the, this is a perfect example of, of, of the way in an age of, of, of negative partisanship, your attitudes start becoming a function of how the issues break down between the parties. Yep. Um, and, and it's not hopeless. So, you know, I, 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 I mentioned this to you a little while ago, a paper just came out, which I think captures a deep truth. And it's by uh, Wong and Green and, and Bazerman, all at Harvard. That's H-U-A-N-G, and, right? Yes. And, um, and it's, it's this clever set of studies where they, um, they ask people to, to take a more abstract stance. They ask people actually to take a veil of ignorance towards political issues. That, that's the John Rawls term. Yeah. The political philosopher said the ideal way to set up a society – I don't know if he said exactly this, but the idea was if, if, if you ask people to choose what society would be like in terms of fundamental rights, the distribution of various assets and, and, and maybe income or whatever, ask them to choose that without knowing who, which role they'll occupy in the society and then, and then tell them, well, we're going to flip a coin. We're going to roll the dice later to decide whether you're born into poverty or affluence or whatever. And Rawls' idea is that this is the way to get people to start thinking about a just and good yeah. society. But anyway, so go ahead. And that's, and, and that's what they find. So, so it gets complicated as Rawls himself believed his views led you away from a utilitarian worldview and more focused on individual rights. But regardless, they, they asked people to take this sort of stance. They gave them different dilemmas, ethical dilemmas, political dilemmas, philosophical dilemmas. And they found that they ended up favoring the view that most people upon reflection would agree was the right one the one that involved the most happiness and the most flourishing. I think, you know, I think we're at our very, very, very worst when it comes to politics because we're, we are, we are, yeah, as you know, tribal, we are, we are more than willing to, to follow wherever they point us regarding empathy and other emotions, but we have the capacity to step out of that. And so for every empathy study like that, I want to sort of give a countervailing study showing that the exercise of reason could be useful for us. Yeah. So, yeah, they, so this is, I mean, they're, they're, the authors of this study are suggesting that this is an actually genuinely useful yep. uh, exercise to, 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 to run people through the veil of ignorance. Of course, the authors seem to be pro-utilitarian. Is that right? I didn't read the yep. whole paper, but so, you know, uh, you can imagine people arguing with that. Uh, yeah, and so – Certainly, Josh Green, who's the middle author, is, is a very much a utilitarian, has defended that. And, right. And, um, but – I think, I think on the margins, we could argue whether utilitarian approach is right or more of a rights-based approach or Kantian approach. But there's a lot of moral decisions and political decisions that are just downright stupid. And I think sort of veil of ignorance um, perspective will get you away from the stupid ones. And we could argue on the margins as to whether this is the right, the right ultimate conclusion. Yeah. I was just thinking popped into my head that conservatives would say, imagine you're a fetus. Uh, and they're thinking about abortion. Yeah. And do you want to live in a world where abortion is legal? And I guess liberals would refuse to play the game saying, no, you can only put me in the shoes of people I consider people, and I don't consider the unborn. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so can we talk briefly about your claim that Tamler had a legit point? <laughs> because the context of uh. this, the context of this is worth getting into, I think. The context is that um, I went on in the wired piece. Uh, I said, um, you know, I, I, the authors are, are not explicitly Darwinian, the authors of the, the, the paper in American political science review. But I said, you know, this all makes sense in Darwinian terms. I quoted Richard Alexander. You knew Richard Alexander probably, right? You met him at least at a conference that you didn't. I think I met him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, he, he died a couple years ago, I think. But uh, he was a biologist who said the, the flip side of within group amity is between group enmity, which puts in a general way, uh, it, it encompasses the finding of uh, this study. And then I got into, you know, the Darwinian logic that naturally if, if, if the genes that 
uh, are kind of sponsoring the deployment of these impulses evolved, you know, are with us by virtue of natural selection, then it makes sense that it wouldn't be all, uh, you know, uh, peace and love and, and you would be designed to actually come up with reasons to dislike certain groups of people and so on. Um, and, and I noted that Alexander, like a lot of people think one of the things we're prone to is a little self delusion about how good we are. And, and I, and then I just kind of ventured a guess as to how that may actually uh, enter into the way people think about their own deployment of empathy. Okay. Because that matters for this study. It was a self report study where you ask people how empathetic you are. And I, and, and I, you know, kind of, uh, hypothesized that leaving aside the question of how good people are at uh, estimating the intensity of their um, empathy, which is what the report asked for in, a, in, a, in the study asked for in effect, um, you would expect them to delude themselves about kind of the legitimacy of their deployment of it. So mm-hmm. like when, it, 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 and for that reason, well, an example is, uh, that I think I gave is like, when you ask people, do you tend to um, feel empathy for the less fortunate, which is one of the questions on that scale? <clears throat> well, they didn't feel any empathy for al-Baghdadi. And he yeah. was very unfortunate on the night of the raid. Yeah. But, but they don't even think about him as a candidate of empathy because he's in such an outgroup. So what I posited was that that, uh, you know, they delude themselves uh, about the legitimacy of their range of deployment of empathy to such an extent that they don't even consider probably uh, the fact that they didn't give him any empathy or they might not give Donald Trump any empathy when they do their own empathy rating. At least that was my conjecture. And I, I uh, Tamla had kind of a problem with that. Um, and, and I didn't actually enter this conversation wanting to get into all of this, but, but, uh, but I think it's a, you know, it make to me it makes sense that we would delude ourselves about the about the deployment of empathy per se, because you would expect us to be designed by natural selection fundamentally to delude ourselves into thinking that the people we treat badly we have good reason to treat badly, and the people we treat well we have good reason to treat well. That's the logic. So that all makes sense to me. I don't know. I, I don't know what Hamler's objection was to that. Uh, that all makes sense. it's he didn't quite. He recognized that I was making that distinction, but he still thought there was something shady, which I don't don't totally understand, that I would just pick this one aspect of self-report that I said was probably valid, although I I actually take it all with a grain of salt. But in this one aspect of self-report that I would not, the the realm of the range of deploying empathy, where I would not expect people to be at all in touch with the reality, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, that seems right. I mean, there, there are there are always limits to these sorts of studies. This is this is of course correlational, so it might be that it's not empathy in this sense per se that's driving any of this, but other personality characteristics that themselves connect with empathy. Um, it might be that that when you ask people these questions, like you said, you're capturing their worldview of themselves um, rather than objective facts themselves. One of the, you know, so one of these differences in political psychology is if you test people on how much empathy they have on these scales, it turns out um, liberals have more empathy than conservatives. These effects are never enormous, but there is it's a real effect. And, they, and, and the lowest of empathy at all is libertarians. But the, <laughs> thing about, but the thing about this is when you tell people, everybody's happy with this result. <laughs> Liberals say, yes, I'm full of empathy. That's great. Conservatives say, no, I'm no tree hugger. You know, I'm, I'm seeing things the way they're supposed yeah, to be. Well, you know, bleeding heart liberal in a slightly earlier age, like when yeah. I was younger, was a pejorative used by conservatives. Yep. Yeah. So, so everybody's kind of happy with it. But therein lies the problem, which is that, that when, you're, when you get the scale, you may be um, kind of living out your own view as to what the right way is to be. So, but, but, you know, you get the correlations. I, I think there's sort of some face, I think the, the findings make sense. Um, they do. I mean, one that, a finding that apparently did make sense to you, judging by an exchange you had on Twitter, which I wouldn't have predicted, uh, is one where self, the validity of self-report again comes into question. And, and here I might argue that you, you should be a little even, even more suspicious of the self-report, but in cognitive empathy, in other words, perspective taking. 
yeah. not feeling what they feel, but understanding how they look at the world. Yeah. The authors that scale, they found no correlation with uh, intensity of partisan antagonism. I mm. might have expected an inverse correlation. I also might expect that you should be a little more suspicious of self-report there, For although that's maybe I just want to believe that. But in mm. any event. Um, no, you're, you're a big defender of perspective taking. So, I am. So I am. It would have been, and, you know, it would have been nice if it, if it worked out the other way. I, I think in the end, though, I think perspective taking might be um, a necessary condition for getting, making progress of the sort you're devoting your life to. But it's not sufficient. Wait, what, what kind of progress am I devoting my life to? I was really afraid you'd ask me that. Um, you know, um, a better world, reconciliation, human progress, flourishing, that sort of thing. Um, um, love. Let, let, peace and love. Less, less acrimony, less, uh, um, you know, more sort of rational discourse. All good stuff. Yeah, puppies. <laughs> puppies. <laughs> Pandas. Mm. Um, so I don't think, I, I think perspective is really good for that. But by itself, and this is what I was on about on, uh, on Twitter a bit, um, it, it's, it's just a form of intelligence. And it's good. Intelligence is good. But, but I mean, uh, uh, intelligence could be used for right or wrong. If I'm a savvy uh, Trump supporter, I'll use my empathic understanding what makes the other side tick to beat them, to, to, to you know, to, to, to sure. take their stuff, to, to beat them in the next election. But I don't think it's just, it's intelligence. I think intelligence is, is I think there's some very smart people who aren't good at this. Yeah. I, I, if you just mean like high IQ, um, in fact, isn't it almost definitely, definitionally true of people on the spectrum that that's one of the things is that they, the theory of mind, uh, part of the mind is not as engaged. It is. I think there's good reason to believe that this sort of social intelligence is separable from other forms of intelligence. Mm -hmm. So what I said was I didn't, it's not intelligence in itself. It's a form of intelligence. It's a form of being smart. You could be mm -hmm. smart about math. You could be smart about planning. You'd be smart about other people. Now, you know, despite what you sometimes hear, these things are massively correlated. Mm. This is a whole room for another discussion, but but whenever people say, "Oh, there's 17 different forms of intelligence or whatever," yeah, but they're really correlated with one another. So if you're really good at understanding people, you're probably smart in other ways. Okay. But anyway, my, my point isn't that it's. I'm totally willing to agree, and you're right that it's separable from other forms of intelligence. But it's just that being smart doesn't make you nice. Being smart just makes you smart. And if you have if you have bad motives, being smart makes you better at being bad. Have you seen the movie Harvey? Rabbit? Yeah, the, well, the giant, yeah, yeah. It's Jimmy Stewart who plays an alcoholic back when people kind of were, when alcoholism was taken as a more lighthearted subject. Yeah. Um, but the line is, but he's a sage. He's a sage alcoholic. Yeah. And the line is something like, I've seen clever and I've seen nice and take my word for it. Nice is better. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great movie. And that's, a, that's, that's a really good line. And it's a great line. But I want to, I want to like push back a little on just uh, saying that cognitive empathy or perspective taking is just another form of intelligence. There, there's something about its interaction with feelings that's a little different from some aspects of intelligence. And what I mean is this, um, if like, I'm like, if there's somebody I'm really pissed off at, and I'm just thinking they're bad. They did this to spite me. They're yeah. in league with someone else who also does it, whatever. And like I meditate and actually feel my uh, loathing of them subside and calm down a little. I may actually, I think, reach a truer understanding of what motivated them. I, don't, I have no way of knowing this is sure, but I, will, I can confidently report that my conception of their motivation will change. And I think in some cases it changes toward the truth. And it's not true in all realms of intelligence that when you get less revved up, they work better. I mean, for example, if, if there's an author that you dislike, mm -hmm. you are, your, your critical acuity, if, as you read their argument, is in some way sharper, right? I mean, I mean you will, you'll be quicker to find the flaw. Now, you may overlook another part, the, the supporting evidence for their argument or something, but there are certain respects in which the motivation of that emotion makes you smarter. <laughs> it's true. The, the great Freddie DeVore once said, your haters are your closest readers. Now, where do you know Freddie from? Oh, uh, just online. Just the just internet. Online. I had him on, on uh, 
on the show long ago. Oh, so, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan, but um, but but he this is certainly his own experience and my experience as well, which is it's actually difficult because I've I've been. <laughs> There's one extreme, extremely nasty review. I'm actually not gonna gonna cite the author. I'm not gonna give this person credit. Oh, come on. No, because oh, was know, it like, in the Times? I, no, we're not gonna do this. I know the exact review. I could no, name this no, person. It's not, it's not. It's not that one. It's well, how much is it worth to you for me to not name this person right you're now? Naming, you're gonna name the wrong person. I, I could withhold military aid from you if I want. <laughs> Okay, this guy wrote a savage review of me where he says uncomplimentary things about me and myself. But the thing is, it had some good points. It was very hard for me to absorb. But how long did it take you to realize that? Yeah, that a still, year? I'm still not quite there. But look, just to go back to what we're talking about, you, you meditate, you relax, and you come to have a better understanding of a person's motives. But, but the conclusion for that isn't that, that it's, it's for the morally good. What if you first thought that, that their person's uh, treatment of you was kind of benign and careless, but upon reflection, you realize correctly that this person hates you and it, and it has a can is mounting a campaign against you and your your best response is to retaliate now sometimes that's true in, in, in that case the 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 wisdom you hope for upon having your emotion settle down a little is wisdom about how to respond yeah like maybe it isn't in my interest you know to start screaming nasty things about yeah. them on twitter but yeah. I, I think that's certainly True. I, I mean, in that, the other kind of um, understanding that can give you is like, well, okay, he hates me, but I did call him like a pedophile in public or something. You know, it's like whatever. You you can you can imagine the uh, the grievance. Yeah. You can appreciate that you had some interaction where yeah, okay, you did something that might naturally antagonize them. But but here, just step back. Here's my point, which is that I, I, you tell me if you agree with this. Suppose I, I am a bad person or I have bad motivations. If you give me tremendous powers of understanding the minds of other people, this will just make me a more successful bad person. I will be a better con man. I will be a better psychopath, seducer, bully. You know, the, the, the person who tortures you, you don't want this person to have an astute understanding of your of your nature. No. I mean, for yeah, right. So... Cognitive empathy in the hands of flat-out sociopaths is bad. Um, happily, they seem to be no more than 5% of us. Um, and, and then, yeah, it's certainly true that, that cognitive empathy can come in handy in a zero-sum game. And so if you, uh, if you think that in a zero-sum game, one side is the, the side of good and the other side of evil, You'll hope that the good side is better at cognitive empathy, yeah. but what, what, but, but that kind of evens out in the wash. I mean, it's probably going to wind up, you know, half the time, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I guess if you had your way, you would only teach cognitive empathy to good people. Sure. But, yes. but my view is that there are a lot of just non-zero sum games in the world where if there were more cognitive empathy, assuming it's, well, does, it doesn't even – I actually, come to think of it, these could be sociopaths, and it might still work. But leave that aside. My view is that uh, if people were better at perspective-taking, things, classic things are mutually destructive wars, where both sides yeah. wind up sustaining massive damage. Tons of people get killed on both sides. It's a non-zero-sum game. It was a lose-lose outcome. I think there are manifestly a lot of cases where a better understanding of what was going in the mind uh, – on in the mind of the other – could have prevented uh, the war. I mean, the classic fallacy is to not understand that, that, that moves they're making that seem offensive to you are defensively motivated. Yeah. You know, yeah. whereas our defensive moves, like we invade Iraq and we would be shocked if, if anybody in the Middle East said, um, this doesn't seem like you did this to defend America. Like America seemed pretty secure to us. Yeah. We, we really don't, you know, we just don't think think through the fact that from a, an objective point of view, that's not an obviously defensive move. I, I agree with you. I think that, that an understanding of how other people work is of tremendous use when you're trying to coordinate non-zero sum games to make the world a better place. But I'm going to sort of out Darwinian you, which is, I think there's a lot to be said for the idea. The reason why we have this extent of cognitive empathy in the first place, it's often called Machiavellian intelligence. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here's why, which is that if you and I are cooperators working together as we are now, there's not, you'll make your, your goals apparent. I'll make my goals apparent. We'll try our best. Um, and so cognitive empathy plays a great role, but where you really need it the most 
is if you and I are competing, where you are under pressure to hide your motives, to deceive me, to lie to me, to trick me, to outfox me. And so I think that's kind of empathy. What it's for is largely, I think, bad purposes. I don't think so, because I think it, I think with both zero-sum games and non-zero-sum games, there are times when it comes in handy, uh, and certainly in non-zero-sum games, time, uh, mm-hmm. certainly in zero-sum games at least, times when it doesn't. I mean, when when you want to kill an enemy, the best thing to think is that they had no grounds for attacking you in the first place or doing whatever it was that annoyed you. What you don't want to do is, is put yourself in their shoes and think, yeah, I guess I would have done the same thing because you want to be able to convince yourself that the best thing to do is kill them. So I think in certain kinds of zero sum games, or at least, well, yeah. games with enemies aren't always zero sum, but in certain kinds of games with enemies, um, shutting down cognitive empathy, I think is a designed feature of human nature. Well, you're looking at one facet of the cognitive empathy. You're doing in terms of your motivation to, to, to get violent and so on. And it's true you might want to need to, and this is stuff you've done a lot of work on, you might need to talk yourself into the idea that this person is terrible and rotten and be oblivious to any evidence to the contrary. I would agree with that. But the cognitive empathy I'm talking about is actually just trying to outwit the person. If I'm, you know, if you and I are in a battle to the death, and then I know, you know, it's really important yeah. for me to know that when Bob is under stress, he goes for a long walk on the beach because they don't show up at the beach. It's really good to know that he's trying to get allies or he's not trying to get allies. I, I would, in any battle to the death, I would give a lot to go to read my opponent's mind. Sure, but, but the, the opponent's mind you're putting yourself into is an opponent's mind. In other words, you're saying, okay, we're locked into this bitter struggle. Yeah. What is the strategically smart thing for that person to do at this moment? Exactly. Well, that's not nearly that person's entire psychology, much less the, the psychological history that led you to become opponents. So I, I'm just saying that, that yeah, that, that you would expect that part of cognitive empathy to be sharp yeah. with opponents. I agree. So your, your view is that, that if I take somebody who's sort of my putative opponent, and if I really knew him, that would calm me down. I say, well, this person doesn't want, isn't the embodiment of evil. They have their own reason. They, they think they're, they're as doing as good as I think I'm doing good, because that's how people work. Well, if he's gotten to a point where he wants to kill you, I wouldn't encourage that. I, I would yeah. encourage focusing on the yeah. fact he wants to kill you and keep it from happening. But, but um, I do think, and, and again, international affairs is a, a frequent context, I think right now coming, arriving at a better and almost all the people we think of as adversaries, Putin, Iranian leadership, I think it would be in our interest to have a clear understanding of their motivation rather than by what is close to a mainstream narrative, which is just that unlike us, they're evil and they're, yeah. and they're just trying to do bad shit and they love it. I just think that's wrong and it gets us into trouble. No, I think that's true. So, okay, so now I understand your view better, which, and, and maybe I, I see it better, which is, I started off by saying perspective taking is a tool, you use it for whatever purpose you, you, you want. And your response I, I see is to say, no, if you perspective take, it will on the whole make you kinder, because you'll realize that other people have their own motivations and just aren't as, as evil as, as you might think they are. I would just say that there are identifiable non-zero-sum games where it will lead, where, where if everyone in the world were better at, at cognitive empathy, we would have better outcomes. Yeah. Now, there are, even in non-zero-sum you know, some games, too much asymmetry of cognitive empathy could itself be a bad thing. I, I think, generally speaking, it's not. I mean, the fear of, like, unilateral disarmament, so to speak, uh, v- by virtue of adopting cognitive empathy is usually a, a mistaken fear. But but the, 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 they're all very complex issues. I'm just saying there's a ton of situations in the world where failure of cognitive empathy on one side or both is leading to trouble. Yeah, I can believe that. So you're a convert. <laughs> are, we, are we adversaries now, Bob? But, uh, no, I'm just no, I, 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 I am a, I, I'm, I'm a convert, but this is where I started with, with in the first place. So if you and I are want to seek towards a cooperative good arrangement. It's really yeah. good to understand each other. But, but if you and I are in opposition, it's really good for, for each of us to be able to figure out what the other one's going to do. It's a game of chess. No, I, I absolutely. 
but, 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 but I'm a convert on one point, which is something I had not thought of, and I think it's true, and it's, it's, it's a good point, which is um, if we are by nature inclined to think others as more malevolent than they are, mm-hmm. then getting it right, having good perspective taking, will we'll tend to diffuse things, we will tend to improve things. And there's, there's a domestic political context, which is, you know, there's an attitude pretty prevalent in the resistance, which is, well, to oversimplify it maybe slightly, Trump supporters are stupid racists. You know, yeah. they're just, it's a kind of essentialism. They're just bad people and we have to beat them. I mean, that's maybe an oversimplification, but I think what it prevents you from doing or discourages is figuring out what circumstances led them to support Trump. And, yeah. and, 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 and I'm not here favoring a, a kind of economic deterministic explanation versus racism. Even if some of them are racist, I would imagine there's something that made them racist, something in their upbringing or in the, or, or maybe something economic in their, you know, I just want to know, I want to understand why they're voting for Trump. And uh, again, um, I think cognitive empathy can facilitate that. And I think that could inform a more effective political strategy in unseating Trump. That's my I think that's true. But now we're going to go back to something you said, which is there's a case for people in the resistance, as it were, to um, to not do that, to continue to believe their enemies are are racist morons. Um, and the 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 concern is that if you are too soft towards your enemies, the the movement dissolves. The movement, you know, you you're not showing, showing solidarity for your movement. This is a very cynical view. But if you go on Twitter uh, tomorrow, and maybe you say something like, you know. Trump voters are perfectly fine. They're not racist, blah, blah, blah. We have to sympathize with them. You will get a significant backlash. <laughs> You've noticed. And, yes. And, it's, and the backlash is not crazy. Whose team are you on? Well, it's not, I, I wouldn't call it quite crazy. I would also point out that if you do the opposite, you'll pick up a lot of followers. That, that's a fundamental yeah. dynamic driving the polarization. Yes. Is that all the incentives at the micro level for the individual social media, aspiring social media star, all the incentives are to demonize the opposition. That's what gets you followers. Yeah. Um, and, but you're right. Yeah. If you say, hey, you know, can we just kind of talk and understand each other? No, that will not make you a titan of social media in this environment. Yeah. Yes. And maybe in some cases, you know, in World War II, maybe we would be right to treat very poorly somebody who said, you know, Hitler and a bunch, you know, it's complicated. You know, so yeah. determinism is true. There's no such thing as evil and everything. People had appreciated his art. <laughs> That's right. People had appreciated that he was really a good painter. We wouldn't be in this mess. You know, it's it's... Everything has a reason. Well, the guy who says that, you know, you're in your War II movie, the platoons marching down the hill, and somebody says, you know, look, there's no free will. It's like, not, not, there's nothing as inherent evil. Well, maybe we should frag that guy. Yeah. He's really getting in the way. No, there definitely is a mobilizing. I mean, sometimes there is uh, inadequate mobilization. And one thing that can increase mobilization is demonizing yeah. uh, the the enemy, I guess I would encourage us to do that when it's most warranted. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. yes. Um, I mean, I, I've been reading some of the literature on negative emotions, and it's interesting that people often choose to have negative emotions. This is somewhat related. And in one of cases, anger. So so there's a series of studies, I'm embarrassed, I forget the author, but, um, but where people will, before entering a difficult negotiation, which they view as confrontational, will try to get themselves angry. These studies also find that people who do so do better in a negotiation. Yeah. It, it's, and, uh, and, you know, taking your view, I think if you looked at the studies don't do this, but if you looked at things on a whole, it's, it's worse off. It's classic prisoner's dilemma. Everybody gets angry. Everybody walks away with less than they would if nobody got angry, but more than they would if they were calm and the other person is angry. Right. I mean, you can go too far. Sometimes people, blow the deal altogether yes for holding but but yeah um i think that's true and and uh i mean this is one reason that you know the fun you know what the fundamental problem of the world is right go no i don't i don't know where to begin it is run by assholes (laughs) and one way this happens is that they do better in negotiations (laughs) and wind up with more money and power so, 
So just reflect on that as you, as you go through your life. That's true. Um, I, uh, okay. No, no, I have nothing further to say about that. It, it is an oddity of the system that we have democratic systems less so than other systems, but, but basically the people who run things um, aren't selected for their wisdom and compassion and morality. They're selected for their ability to get to the position where they run things. Yes, but often it, it helps them to seem as if they have compassion and yes. morality. Yes, yes. And again, again, to double back to Trump, um, Trump, uh, among Trump supporters, I think Trump has done a very good, good job of making him seem, uh, of making them believe that he is on their side, that he has care for them, love for them. Well, I think he has done that. Uh, he does not direct his venom toward them, for starters. He directs a lot of venom, but it ain't toward them. Um, and uh, the other thing is, is, is if you're, you know, the more pissed off you are at the other side, the more willing you are to forgive things in your leader. Yeah. There may be things they don't like about him, but uh, that's another reason that I think too much uh, resistance antagonism may not be a good thing. Anyway, I'll also say just for me, I don't know about you, but for me, the last many years with Trump, for me, it's been an enormous failure of cognitive empathy. There were, I can really, I can recite back the reasons why somebody would vote for Trump. You know, basically the reason which comes to mind is for certain class of people, they view mainstream Democrats and mainstream Republicans as not having their back, as caring what other people not Or care. even being contemptuous of them. Or even being contemptuous of both, both Republicans and Democrats and Trump. This this brash billionaire, for some reason, didn't have contempt for them. I could understand it. But as the years go by, I am just can't understand how anybody could still support Trump. You're talking about my siblings, man. Careful. Yeah, I know. I know. I got I. But and I, I know people I know people who could hold her nose and vote for him for some reason. They care about Supreme Court. They're very conservative. And so well, that, that is with, one, with at least one sibling. That's it. It's totally about abortion in the Supreme Court. One hundred percent. So you yeah. see the logic. If that's really that important to you. Well, yeah, yep. that's the whole yep. thing. But but, you know, there's um, and, and this is not, you know, in some way, this is like a running. This is a sort of standard trope. Uh, Pauline Kael, uh, the New York Times film yeah. critic. Said, you know, I was so surprised Nixon won. None of my friends were going to vote for him. <laughs> and and but but this is not that. I can understand why people voted for Romney for McCain. I you know I, you know, I get it. I get it. Not not me, but but I get. I can understand their arguments. I can see it. Trump is just. I, I think part of the, the reasons why why it's going to be the end of the world if Trump gets reelected is the shock of knowing that your friends and neighbors are are so different from you. Um, you mean, well, you haven't had to come to terms with that already. Oh, you, you mean it's one thing for them to vote for them once. It's another thing for them to do it twice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I sometimes, uh, yeah, have the same (laughs) problem, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think the principles at play are the ones I've described. If people feel they're being not only ignored, but held in contempt, uh, and have sufficient amount of animosity toward the group that uh, that is the opposition. And in the case of a lot of them, the, a group that they think is like murdering uh, babies or whatever else, yeah. um, you know, you will forgive a lot in a leader. If you think it's a lot, I, I mean, for example, I'll vote for any Democrat, okay? Now, a lot of them I won't like much, but because Trump is the enemy, yeah. right? I'll, I'll swallow hard and, and, yeah. and, and vote for, and, and, and and I may have to swallow hard. I mean, don't even get me started talking about how utterly the Democrats have failed to uh, field the kind of, you know, surefire way of beating Trump candidate. Uh, you think by now we aim into, into, into politics more, but less psycho. But but my feeling is my whole life, there's oh, we always come to a point where Democrats say, isn't it? We just don't have the perfect candidate. Where did the perfect candidate go? We've drunk a bunch of losers. Well, it's true that, I mean, how often have Republicans had the, this is an interesting question. Part of the problem is they they ran Bob Dole. I mean, you know, it's, they all, in the end, there's always a point where, where, where there's immense frustration because there's no, nobody who's a perfect candidate because, and what we're missing is the system. There's no such thing as a perfect candidate. You're saying Bob Dole was a bad candidate? 
Yeah, I think Bob Dole is a bad Because guy. compared to Trump, he was Abraham Lincoln. I mean, seriously, if you run Bob Dole against Trump, he wins in a landslide. Fair enough. Fair enough. But my point is, we're looking at the Democratic uh, pool and we say, oh, there's no perfect candidate. But no, it isn't just that. It's that the leading candidates, and, and I want to say, first of all, I like Bernie Sanders a lot more than most people do and, or a lot more than some people, and think he, he in principle, would have a, a, a much better chance of beating Trump uh, than people think if it were not for the fact that his firmly held position on health care permits Republicans to say he will take away your health insurance and give you some untested thing that you don't, you know, yeah. you don't. That, I think, is probably the kiss of death. If it weren't for that, I wouldn't be saying that the top three candidates all are, you know, far from obvious victors over Trump. But they are. You yeah. got two guys in their late 70s. Yeah. One who's like, you know, 70 or whatever Elizabeth uh, Warren is. Uh, I, I never, I've done this before. I'll shut up. But, yeah. but, but what it reflects is partly the decline of uh, party, the rule of party elites. It's the same reason Trump was able to get the Republican nomination. Yep. Party elites no longer call the shots. Um, so do, should we talk more about dehumanization? Do you? Oh, yeah, dehumanization. Uh, so there was this paper. Uh, we, we didn't mention the name of this author. Did we? Uh, great name. Harriet. Is it Harriet Over? Yes. Great name. O-V-E-R. I don't think yeah. I've ever heard that as a last name before. Um, and she is a philosopher or a... She's a psychologist. She's psychologist. a developmental psychologist in the UK. Uh, development, yeah, she, she studies kids. She's done some work with dehumanization of kids, actually, where she, she was pushing a sort of, look how kids dehumanize the outgroup. But then she popped up with this great theoretical article. And uh, I was one of the reviewers, signed my review. And, I, and, I, and, and I've got to tell you something about academia, by the way. Um, a lot of people who, who were reviewing and talking about it were themselves... Uh, fans of the view she was arguing against, but you know they gave the paper a fair read. And mm-hmm. sometimes, sometimes academics can take arguments against their favorite view and say, "This is a good argument. Let's get it out there." Good to hear. You know, it's not all tribal. So anyway, what she so there's a view out there just to give the, the thirty second summary that um, we dehumanize others, that we um, we think of them as non human animals, we think of them sometimes as robots, as machines. We strip them of their humanity. We don't think of them as people. And this licenses all sorts of cruelty and, 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 and violence and genocide. And this view, I think, has a lot of truth to it. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that we, that for dehumanization through history, there's often explicit dehumanization where people you know, say to each other, um, oh, these Indians, they aren't people. Uh, this person is, this isn't a person, it's three quarters of a person, three, whatever. You, you, but, I have a feeling, and I made the argument uh, in a New Yorker piece that I think we, we talked about, uh, Kate Mann in her wonderful book, Down Girl, makes mm-hmm. this argument. I, I had her on the show. And you had her on the show. And that this is really overstated. And often, when we, uh, often what you see from white supremacists, from, uh, from uh, uh, opposing groups, isn't dehumanization. It's a recognition of the other person's humanity and all of the attitudes that go with this. Um, Anger, fear, hatred, disgust, moral disapproval, uh, uh, worries about being humiliated by the person. Uh, and so what Harriet Over does is she makes the case that the dehumanization argument is overstated. And so one thing she says following this other work is a lot of the people, the, the worst atrocities involve a full recognition of humanity of other people. And another thing she says, a kind of interesting argument is, you know, seeing somebody as non-human isn't necessarily back. You know, we see dogs as non-human. We see pandas as non-human. doesn't mean we, we if I see a panda, I don't want to torture it and make it suffer and kill it. We see, to some extent, babies as not fully human. They aren't in some sense, but we don't want to kill babies. We, we protect babies more than we protect adults. So, so she sort of wants to realign how we think about animosity. That's a very good article. And she also made the point, I actually took uh, my Chicago Bulls reference yes. in the early part of the conversation from her paper. She notes that often, you know, we, we, we use uh, animals iconically in a way that's flattering to yeah. people. Um, yeah, I mean, this makes, of course, you are a, a pioneer, uh, a pioneering skeptic of the, uh, the, the, the mainstream dehumanization narrative. Uh, that it is the great evil, it is the great facilitator of atrocity, and if we could just quit dehumanizing 
people, everything would be okay. You've been skeptical of you. And I think, I mean, I hadn't thought about it much before you started talking about it, but I do think one thing that, one warning sign about the mainstream dehumanization narrative is, although it doesn't explicitly, and maybe not even in an inexorably logical way, make this presupposition, it seems to, in a way, grow out of the view that it's not natural for people to kill other people. In other words, natural selection would not have designed us to just kill other people. So it must be that we we have to get into a totally different frame of mind and think about them as non-people. How else could it happen? Well, no. I mean, I think natural selection did design us, uh, it, sadly, and in, in ways that it's important for us to understand so that we can make wanton killing less common, um, did design us to sometimes be inclined to kill other people. So, uh, and, and in fact, if you look at the kinds of things we say about people to justify the killing of them, we're often, and, I, and she probably gets into this, but, but uh, we're talking about exclusively human traits, right? We, we will cite attitudes they had or thoughts or things they did that only a human could have. And we will say, that's the reason they deserve to die. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's an optimistic view which is if you fully know other people, you fully recognize them as people, you would never want to hurt them. And, but you know, it, it's not very consistent with, with evolution. It's not very consistent with history or common sense. And, and you look at modern, at, at modern examples, you look at, uh, at crowds chanting about Clinton, lock her up. Well, <laughs> you, you don't lock up, you know, you, you don't lock up cockroach. You don't lock up lice. You lock up a person who's done terrible things or, the white supremacist thing uh, about the Jews, you will not replace us. It's such a great phrase because it captures so much anxiety. It's, it's, it's not, you don't worry. It's, it's not that they think of the Jews as non-human vermin. It's like, it's like they're this panic that the, that the, these outsiders are taking over. Right. Taking what, what, what should be ours. And, you know, Kate Mann points out that a lot of the, the misogynist rhetoric and treatment is, is guys who are saying, you know, these women are humiliating me. They aren't giving me my due. They don't respect me. And those are very human attitudes. Right. And I mean, the, th the things Trump said about immigrants, I mean, they'll take your job, they'll rape your women. I, I mean, you know, it's like, uh, these are things that, that uh, yeah. only humans do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think it gets complicated. There's, a, there's people I respect a lot. There's, a, you know, David Livingston Smith, for instance, is a, a scholar. He has a, a book coming out called On Inhumanity. And he really makes a dehumanization claim. And I think a lot of his arguments are good. There are some other cases, for instance, where it's pretty clear we're not thinking of those people as people. Where, where, and these don't tend to involve intimate torture or rape, whatever. It often involves, like, you know, let's take, let's take the land that these guys have. And it doesn't matter. It is not... They don't matter now. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, let me say that just to forestall some feedback, I understand Trump didn't literally say what I just said. They will rape your way. He said, but he did use, the I think, the term there are rapists and so on. And then he said, and some of them are good people. So whatever he said, he said, but 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 there was the, the subtext too. Um, the, uh, oh, wait, now what was I going to say in response to what you just said? Uh, yeah, I think. What did, you just, what did you just say? Why don't we start with that? Um, I said, I, I, I pulled back a little bit. I pointed out there's work. Oh, I know I, what I was going to say. Okay, okay, I got it. Smith in particular. It's all coming back. You, you, you might well compare people to animals that we have a low opinion of, yeah. like, like vermin, rats, but you might also compare them to inanimate things that we have a, a, yeah. a low opinion of, right? I mean, uh, you know, cesspools. Or yeah, whatever. exactly. Exactly. Um, and, so, and also a lot of dehumanization rhetoric is, is um, and it, it, it's, it often gets its force just because we aren't actually dehumanizing. You know, if you call somebody a dog or a pig and you call it to their face to humiliate them, that kind of presupposes they aren't a dog or a pig. You know, right. um, it, it's kind of an obvious point, but, but in, in Europe, soccer players uh, throw uh, bananas at African players and make monkey calls but right. it's not because they literally think they're monkeys no a monkey wouldn't be offended right a monkey wouldn't be offended it's, it's because in your humans you humiliate a person by depicting them as less than what they are right yeah so and so now the overarching question do you not agree with me that the consequences of our not 
having a subtle understanding of empathy and how selectively we deploy it and how sometimes it gets us to massively misappropriate resources or get into fights or wars that are unnecessary and all this kind of stuff. Do you agree with me that that is, in a way, a more important uh, problem than not appreciating that dehumanization is really not the root of all evil? Yeah, kind of? I, I, I agree with that. I mean, the dehumanization issue is in some way, I think people have the wrong theory of evil. But it's not the end of the world. You have the wrong theory of evil. Right. It's like, um, it's still, in other words, it's still bad to call people rats and vermin. Yeah. And, and, right. and, and it does facilitate the, the bad treatment of them, which is probably mm-hmm. your goal. So, you know, in some ways, not, not in all cases, but sometimes it's an academic question. But the uh, empathy point matters because it matters for questions of who we give to, how we give money to charity, who we go to war with. Who we who we vote for, what our policies are, how we treat those we love, yeah. um, and and it's of it, it it under the question of empathy underscores this question of how do we make decisions about things that matter, and um, and there's and and so and there's a real difference where where there's a real a lot of people will argue both regular people also scholars listen to your heart follow your gut, and and I think so much of my work has been saying. Don't listen to your heart. Don't listen to if I could have if I could have a billboard that I would say, don't listen to your heart. Don't go with your gut. No, your 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 gut your gut in some limit your your gut will follow. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll talk in your language because it's my language too. Will follow with Darwinian imperatives, but as reflective people, we say no. Our, there's there's more to life than helping our tribe and helping and helping our family and helping those close to us. From your you lips know? to God's ears. No, wait, from your lips to people's ears. Yeah. If there's a God, God knows this. To people's ears. To people's ears. Um, so uh, we should, so this has been great. It's been fun uh, as always. Now, are you going to, do you think you'll go on Very Bad Wizard soon? I feel like, I feel now having like. I think you're escalating the importance of this, this little Twitter brew. Well, no, but the reason I'm mentioning Tamler's podcast and David Pizarro's podcast is, uh. I feel a little bad about kind of replying to him without him here to reply to me. So I feel I should plug his podcast as a, as a kind of, you know, payback. Uh, at the same time, he should have me on it. And, 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 and he should have you on it, but does. He does frequently, right? You're like, you're like the Ed McMahon of, of Very Bad Wizards, right? Now, now for, for your podcast, I'm nowhere near close to one of your favorite guests. You've oh, had. come on. Who is more favorite? Who, no, I, who sorry, is more I, beloved? I, I mean, no, I, I, beloved, yes, but I meant in a numerical sense. Um, who, who is the person you've had on the most? Well, over the ages, Mickey <laughs> Cows. But, uh, and I'm actually going to apparently tape one with him tomorrow. Of course, Mickey has gone to the dark side, as we all know. It's, it's, it's so rare you could find a Trump supporter to argue with. Yeah, I've more supporter, than right? one, and I should have more on. But Mickey is uh, is one. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh. But so Mickey, uh, once you rule out Mickey, I I think you would be hard pressed to find people uh, I've had on with uh, greater frequency than you over the last couple of years. Honestly, I probably we've done this will be the third in the last year at least. Yeah, we do a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But you're always welcome. I mean, you're the one. You're the tough get. You know, you're like, you're like, I email you and you're like, talk to my people, talk to my, talk to my assistant's assistant. That's right. And then we talk about money, the, the, the money negotiation. And then the money, right. Talk to my assistant about scheduling. Talk to my agent about the money. Yeah. 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 Or am I getting you mixed up with somebody else? I know that, 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 that's me. That's me. I'm sure, you know, um, I'll send you my invoice. And, and then, and then, oh, Bob, I've decided I can't do it today. Which actually well, happened. Which actually happened this time. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, and my reason was I just forgot it to put it in my calendar. Right. So it was very important. What, what higher form of contempt is there for someone than just forgetting about? Like, if I were like Barack Obama, would you have forgotten? Unlikely. Unlikely. If Unlikely. I were Donald Trump, you wouldn't have forgotten. I would probably remember if I was going to do a podcast. If I were Donald. an animal. If I were not human. Maybe my forgetting you is sort of rooted in my appreciation of your humanity in some complicated way. Well, then we. I, I am sorry. I am sorry for standing you up. Okay. Okay. All is forgiven. Uh, we should 
tell people where they can um, reach us. You go first. You're. Um, uh, I'm, my email. If you Google my name, you get my email. And you I'm don't not, have to. You don't have to. You don't have to do that. Give them your assistant's assistant email. Email, but you should tell them that at Twitter you're at Paul Bloom at Yale. That's a T. Right. Since there's already right. been one at, right. at the very yep. big at one at symbol, the very beginning. I'm Robert Ryder. Ha ha. Ryder is a pun. Um, I published a non-zero newsletter. You Google it. You can subscribe for free. You've written list some books. I've, I've listed them already at the outset, but, but mention some faves. I, I give us all my books. I wrote uh, How Children Learn the Meanings of Words, which is my first book, a university press book. I kind of can tell what it means, what it's about. Um, then uh, Descartes' Baby, How Pleasure Works, Just Babies, and uh, Against Empathy. And are you working on another book? I am. I'm like working on a book on, uh, on um, why we choose to suffer. Why we right. choose, why we get pleasure and meaning from uh, chosen suffering. Everything right. from marathons to BDSM to uh, having kids. <laughs> so. Is the last part supposed to be a punchline or that's... I don't know. I just came. I'm, I'm trying it out now. So, so you know, there'll that, be a... That, th- the answer there is obvious. We don't, we don't fully appreciate the suffering when we make the decision to have them, assuming we make the decision. And one of the miracles of nature is that you don't really have to decide to have them in order to have yeah, them. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So anyway, so, um, so yeah, and you can find me on Twitter and that sort of thing. Yeah, or, or, okay. Or here for that matter. Just, or here. Just go here and I can, I'm off in there. Google psychopolitics because w- that has become a kind of a rubric of ours. And I think we'll put it in the, in the, in the title of this one too. This Perfect. will be our title. Thank you for having me on again. Thank you, Paul. This was great. And we'll see you as soon as you want, as soon as you want it to happen. I'm telling you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, good. See you around.